Okay. I have to speak very gently because Ms. Ms. Kang is asleep. <laughs> okay, today's, uh, today's lecture is about uh, interfaces. And uh, we're going to deal with the structure of an arbitrary interface. You know, we've, we've done a very, very simple tilt boundary. But if I gave you just any two different crystals and join them up together, how would you calculate a possible dislocation structure of the boundary? Okay. So this is a, a dislocation. Uh, what is the normal method that we use in order to find the Burgers vector of this dislocation? There's a particular operation that you do to define the Burgers vector of the dislocation. Yeah. Any ideas? Uh, what, what is the formal way of defining the Burgers vector of the dislocation? Hmm. Yeah, do, you, do you remember something called a Burgers circuit? Yeah? So what we do is we draw a pattern in the undistorted part of the crystal. And then we draw exactly the same pattern in the distorted part, and the closure failure of that gives you the Burgers vector. So here, for example, is a right-handed pattern, which I'm drawing in the perfect part of the crystal. Oh, it's already dimmed. And now I'm going to draw the same pattern. In other words, go three steps upwards, four this way, three down, and four this way in the distorted part of the crystal here. So there we go. Um, start from here, here, here. Exactly the same operation leaves a gap. Okay, And that's called the closure failure. And that defines the Burgers vector of the dislocation. Right? Now, we are going to do the same thing for an interface, because the interface contains dislocations. So if we draw a Burger circuit, in the perfect crystal without an interface, and then introduce an interface, then we should be able to work out the Burgers vector content of that interface, right? But in this case, you know, this is a simply one vector here, whereas an interface is a plane. So we can't talk about the total Burgers vector content of the interface. We can say the total Burgers vector crossing a particular vector inside the interface. Okay, And if I change the orientation of that vector, the Burgers vector of dislocations crossing that vector will be different. Yeah. So if I have, have only one set of dislocations in the interface, then clearly there are no dislocation, there's no Burgers vector content parallel to the line vector if these are edges. Right? So in a plane, we also have to define the orientation of the vector along which we are counting the Burgers vectors of dislocations. Okay. So let me illustrate that. So we're going to use exactly the same kind of procedure to define the Burgers vector crossing a particular vector in the interface. So this is my interface here. And these are two arbitrary crystal structures. All right? So I haven't said that it's cubic f or whatever. They can be completely different. They need not be the same crystal structures. And I'm defining a Burgers circuit. This is crystal A, and this is crystal B. And I simply define a Burgers circuit around the interface. Okay? So I've started by defining it around the defect. And this is simply a vector inside the interface, OP. Now, in order to define the same circuit in the perfect crystal, I've got to get rid of the interface. right? The interface is the defect. So what I do is I deform this into this crystal using, uh, using the deformation ASA to the minus 1. ASA transforms A into B. So if I want to change B into A and eliminate the interface, then I multiply by this deformation matrix. right? So when I do that, I cre create the perfect crystal without any interface. right? And the vector OP becomes OP dashed here. Yeah? by the deformation ASA to the minus 1. And that is my closure failure. Yeah? Do you see? This has no defect in it. But if I apply the same deformation to the whole of the circuit, I will get this as the closure failure. 
this part doesn't get deformed because it was already in A. Yeah? So we've done the same operation that we defined a circuit around the interface and we are observing a particular vector P inside the interface. We deform this crystal so that it becomes this one and the interface disappears. Right? If these were two identical crystals, we could just rotate. Yeah, and the rotation is a kind of a deformation. Yeah. So we eliminate this crystal, the interface disappears, and the vector P becomes the vector P dashed, and we've got this extra bit, which is the total Burgers vector content crossing the vector P. Is everybody happy with that? So that's the total Burgers vector content. Uh, you know, if there are 10 dislocations crossing the, the vector P, then it's 10 times the Burgers vector of an individual dislocation. Okay? Right, so the vector P is uh, this OP, and the closure failure here is the total Burgers vector content crossing the vector P. And if you look at the geometry here, okay, then the vector B, uh, the total Burgers vector, is simply equal to P minus P dashed, isn't it? Yeah. If I take P and I remove P dashed, then I've got the Burgers vector BT, which is parallel to this, right? So the vector P is equal to uh, the vector B. Yeah just from geometry. Everyone happy with that? So, here's the vector P, if I multiply AP by the identity matrix, yeah? and here's the vector P dashed. And that gives me the total Burgers vector crossing the particular vector P in the interface. Okay? So this is my equation, which defines the Burgers vector at any arbitrary orientation in the interface. Now, of course, when you look in the transmission electron microscope, you'll see discrete dislocations, right? So what we've got to do is factorize BT, the total Burgers vector content, into discrete dislocations. And in general, you need three sets of dislocations to accommodate an arbitrary misfit. Okay, in the tilt boundary that we looked at, we just had one set of dislocations because it was a very simple boundary, right? But in a general interface between any two crystals, any orientation, you would need three sets of dislocations. So we want to decompose this into three sets of dislocations inside the interface, which you would be able to see using a transmission electron microscope as long as they are sufficiently far apart from each other, right? Okay, so this was uh, our uh, ordinary tilt interface, very, very simple. You know, we are tilting about the line vector, and from simple geometry, we obtained the distance between dislocations as a function of the Burgers vector and the misorientation angle. And we will now want to do it generally for any interface, in which case BT will in general consist of three sets of dislocations, B1, B2, and B3. Okay, so that, that's what we are going to do next decompose BT into three sets of dislocations. Okay, so this is a plan view of the interface, all right? So if we are looking at the interface, uh, and the interface normally is pointing out of the plane of the board, and I've only illustrated one set of dislocations, the I indicates one, two, or three, then these are the line vectors of the dislocations here, okay? Uh, this is the Burgers vector of that particular set of dislocations. This is my vector P, and that's the distance between the dislocations, the D, right? Everyone happy with this? Okay. Now, the vector M here is at 90 degrees to the line vector, and it lies in the interface, okay? So we write the vector M is equal to the unit normal to the interface crossed with the line vector of the dislocations 
and its magnitude we divide by the spacing here. Okay, so that's the definition of the vector m. So m has the magnitude which is 1 upon the spacing of those dislocations. So there's not, nothing clever here. These are unit vectors, right? So when I take a cross product, that gives me a vector which is lying at 90 degrees to the line vector and to the normal, to the interface, and its magnitude is 1 upon the spacing. If I take a dot product of m with p, then what do I get? Well, m has a magnitude 1 upon d, right? So basically what we get is the number of dislocations that are crossing the vector p. Okay? Because if I take a dot product of p along m, then I'm just looking at the projection of p in this direction. And then the magnitude of m is 1 upon d. So p dot m is simply the number of dislocations crossed by the vector p. OK? So p crosses m dot p dislocations. And the total Burgers vector content for this set of dislocations, if i is 1, is simply given by the number of dislocations crossed by p times the Burgers vector. And if there is another array of dislocations and a third array of dislocations, then we add these up as well. OK? So we haven't, uh, at the moment, calculated what these quantities are. But this is just a formal uh, expression for the total Burgers vector content in terms of the number of these dislocations times their Burgers vector plus the number of these dislocations times this, and so on. OK? Right, so going back to our expression here, where the total Burgers vector content is p minus p dashed, p minus p dashed. Uh, I'm going to write this matrix here, I minus ASA to the minus 1, as that for short, ATA. And again, this is just repeating our equation. And here we have the expanded form of uh, this equation, that M, which is written in the reciprocal basis, times P times B1 plus M2 times P times B2, blah, blah, equals ATA times AP, OK? ATA times AP. Yeah. So this is just the expanded form of the same equation, OK? So this, this matrix is actually quite important because it defines completely the Burgers vector content across any vector in the interface. So I'm now going to uh, define this, this vector here, exactly as we define reciprocal lattice vectors for the unit cell. B1 star is equal to B2 star, B2 cross B3 over the volume of the cell formed by B1, B2, and B3. And take a dot product between this and this. Okay? So if I take a dot product between this and this, then this will be 1. Yeah? This will be 0, and this will be 0. Yeah. So B1 times this here, ATA times AP, will simply equal to M1 times P. OK? So we, we've lost these terms completely. Yeah. So if I, if I dot this with B1 star, then B1 star dot B1 is 1, and therefore we end up with just this part here which is m1 dot p. OK? Is everyone happy with that? OK, so here's that equation repeated. All right? And I'm now going to say that the vector p in my interface is the line vector. OK, I can, I can, I can choose any vector p in the interface for this equation. Yeah? I can substitute any vector p inside the interface. So I'm going to designate it as the line vector. Right? So I've got b1 times ata and the line vector equals 0. Now why is that 0? 
Yeah, so what I've done is I've substituted for the line vector here and here. Substituted P for the line vector. Any ideas? <coughs> yeah? They are perpendicular to each other. Yeah, look, look. M and L are normal to each other, right? M is the distance between dislocations, so it's got to be normal to the line vector, right? Therefore, M dot L will be zero. Okay? So I've got this B1 into this equals zero. If I take the transpose of that, then this becomes a row vector, that's the transpose of this matrix, and this is the transpose of this matrix. And I define this here as a vector C1. Okay? And C1 will, because this is zero, C1 will be at 90 degrees to L1. Okay? Okay, so I've defined another vector C1. Now, instead of uh, using the line vector for P, I'm going to substitute M in here, okay? So for both of these P's, I substitute M. So M1 times M1 is simply the magnitude of M1 squared, the dot product between M1 and M1. So this part here is equal to the magnitude of M1 squared. So in other words, what we are saying um, okay, so this, this is simply the um, transpose of this, okay? And therefore I can write M1 into C1 is equal to the magnitude of M1 squared, okay? M1 dot C1 is the magnitude of M1 squared. Now you can see that C1, if I project it along this axis, then its magnitude will be M1, yeah? And then I multiply by M1, then it's just the magnitude of M1 squared. Yeah. So we've got this geometry illustrating the normal to the interface, the line vector, the distance one upon the spacing of the dislocations, and this is this new vector C1 that we've defined. And just by geometry, uh, this, this vector here will be C1 dot n, which is this distance here, if I project C1 along n. Yeah? then that's just C1 dot N, and that's a magnitude, and it's along the unit vector N. So, so you, you can see how this vector is derived, right? So this defines the complete geometry of this system. Okay. And from that geometry, I can write that M1 here is equal to C1 minus uh, plus this vector. Okay? So that's simply that equation. Now, this is a unit vector, so when I cross M1 with N, uh, that will be equal to C1 cross N. If, if, you know, if I cr take a cross product with N on this side, yeah, then this is simply M1 cross N, this will be C1 cross N, and you can see that this would disappear. Yeah. So that has a magnitude 1 upon D1. So once I've got my vector C1, I've solved the spacing between dislocations. Okay. And the line vector is easy because if I take the cross product of C1 with N, then I get the line vector. Okay. So we've solved for the spacing between dislocations and also the line vector. So for that array of dislocations, the problem is completely solved. And we repeat this process for the second set of dislocations and the third set of dislocations. If you've got complete coherency along a particular direction, then your spacing will be infinite. Okay? So you don't have to make any assumptions about how many sets of dislocations are likely to be there. So we've solved for the structure of the interface in terms of three sets of dislocations. Now, 
One thing that I didn't mention at the beginning is that you have to begin with the assumption of the Burgers vectors. Yeah? So you say, OK, I'm likely to have these Burgers vectors in the interface, and then do the decomposition and see whether that's correct when you make an observation. Yeah? Or you could decide that, look, the Burgers vectors are likely to be the smallest vectors, yeah? because you know, the energy of a dislocation scales with b squared. Yeah? So you might have some physics to let you choose the particular Burgers vectors in the interface. OK? <coughs> yeah, so this vector C1, OK, so we've got a very simple equation here of the line vector and the magnitude uh, or the distance between the dislocation. And this vector C1, all you need is that deformation matrix, you know, ATA is equal to I minus ASA to the minus 1, yeah? And the transpose of that is AT dashed A. And this is straightforward to calculate, B1 star. And therefore, you can calculate C1, and that gives you the line vector, because you take C1 cross N, that will give you the line vector. And uh, that vector also gives you the spacing of the dislocations. OK? So we've solved the problem for a completely general interface. Okay. Right, now I'm going to just show you a little bit more about coincidence side lattices. You remember this um, little movie where we have uh, a hexagonal crystal, we slice it in half in the plane of the board, and we rotate one half with respect to the other, keeping the origin fixed. Yeah? Oops, the daisy. I, I just want to preserve the pattern. That's why I'm starting. Whoops, yeah. OK. So, so you can see that uh, you know, at particular orientations, you get coincidence. Yeah? Uh, so these are called the coincidence site points. And they actually form a pattern, which is called a coincidence site lattice. And the fraction of points which are coincident, if you take the reciprocal of that fraction, that gives you the sigma value for the CSL. Yeah? Clean steel laboratory. But actually, it's coincident side lattice. <coughs> I wish Professor Sasaki was here, you know, because that was a good joke. OK. This is a particular illustration for a sigma 7 boundary where the white points here are all in coincidence. And if I, if I take a primitive vector here, OK, any primitive vector, and I multiply it by 7, then I end up at a coincidence side point. OK, that's the meaning of the CSL. So if I take this and I do 7 steps, then I end up at another coincidence site. Yeah, so that's my primitive vector there and multiplied by 7, and I end up at a coincidence site. All right? So that's the property of a CSL. And furthermore, you see this vector is actually a lattice vector of both crystals, yeah? because these points are exactly coincident for both crystals. Right? So if it's a lattice vector in one crystal, it's also a lattice vector in the other. Yep. OK, so this is showing the same thing on my model, right? That this vector is actually a lattice vector of both crystals, the one underneath and the one above, yeah, because the lattice points are exactly coincident there. Now, imagine that we've got these two cubic crystals, and the 0, 0, 1 axis is pointing out of the plane of the board. If I rotate this by 36.8 degrees, about 001, then I end up with this orientation. And when I superimpose the two, I get a sigma 5 boundary. Right? So if I go five steps along here, then I get exact coincidence. Okay? Now, supposing I look at this primitive lattice vector U of the first crystal. Right? Primitive means you know, there are no common factors in, in 
its components. Okay? This will have integral indices, like one, two, three, because it's going from one lattice point to the other. Okay? Now, if I multiply that vector u by the deformation which creates the red crystal, then which vector do I get? There's only one other vector illustrated on the diagram. Yeah. The so, the yeah, so you get x. Yeah? <coughs> so if I, if I take um, ASA, which is the rotation of 36 degrees about 001, and multiply it by u, then I get the vector x. Okay. Now, will the vector x in this matrix have integral indices? No, because you can see it doesn't, it starts over here, but with respect to the black crystal, it, it ends somewhere in the middle, yeah? So it's not a lattice vector of crystal A. How about if I wrote um, would that have integral indices? So B is the red crystal. Yeah, you can see it ends here. Because you know, if you deform a lattice vector of A, it must become a lattice vector of B. It's a homogeneous deformation, so the lattice points simply move to different positions, but they still remain as lattice points, right? So this vector X has integral indices in the red crystal, but not in the black crystal. But supposing now that I multiply this by sigma. In this case, sigma is 5, right? So that vector is sigma x. Now, does that have integral indices in A? Yes. Yeah, because look, this is a coincident point, right? So it, this will be a lattice vector of both A and B, right? <coughs> So if I multiply this equation by sigma on both sides, okay, then this vector and this vector have integral indices, right? And that's only possible if sigma ASA has integers in it. Sigma times ASA has integers in it, right? Okay. So we have a very, very beautiful and simple way of finding out the sigma value. You know, you take your, okay, so first I'll repeat what I've just done on the board, that this is a primitive lattice vector of A, but this is not. But it is a lattice vector of B, yeah? If I multiply by sigma, then it's a CSL vector, yeah? And therefore, it must have integral components in both A and B. And therefore, this matrix here, sigma times ASA, must have integers in it. Okay? And, and you can regard sigma as the term which makes everything inside that matrix an integer. Okay? So if you can find a common factor inside your rotation matrix which converts everything into an integer, then that's w the one upon the sigma value. So you just calculate a rotation matrix, find a common factor which will convert everything inside that matrix into an integer, and that's one upon sigma. Okay. So what is the sigma value here? Three. Three. Uh, this is actually a twin. Okay, and a, a mechanical twin in BCC is a sigma three orientation. All right. This is the deformation which takes the FCC crystal of austenite into epsilon ion without a volume change, right? So if I convert everything in here into integers, then what is the sigma value? 12, okay? So if you want to work out the sigma value, you find the fraction which will convert 
everything inside the matrix into integers, and one upon that gives you the sigma value. Now, I think that is my last slide. Now, I've got some good news for you, yeah? This is the last lecture, okay? <laughs> so, so, but, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't get up early and start your work at 8 o'clock, okay? But this is the last lecture. I'd like the second assignment definitely by Friday, okay? Because remember, this is a three-credit course, yeah? So I need to provide evidence that you've understood things. And next Friday, if I can have the third question sheet to mark, okay? And if you do that, you know, everything will be okay even if you get little bits of it wrong, but I want to see the assignments, yeah? And I, I will mark them and I will give you the answers as well, okay? Okay, thank you.